you know, if you look at the difference between Nick Timothy and, Tra and Trevor Kavanagh, it's, really all comes down to tax and spend, doesn't it? How much you tax and how much you spend. In part, but I thought I think it also comes down to reform. So I think Nick Timothy is on the money, um, and this is a great piece, and I think the Prime Minister would do well to listen to him, uh, former advisor Theresa May, because he's saying that, actually, in order to deal with some of these very entrenched problems, so regional equality, we've battled with it for decades and failed to solve it, against the backdrop of 10 years in which living standards have been stagnant, you can't rely on the old prescription if you just leave it to the market, you do a bit of infrastructure spend and you hope for the best. And he's saying that actually it requires a different form of economic policy, which I have a lot of sympathy for. I think there will be a new consensus that actually you do need more interventionist policies. And he talks about, you know, investing in social infrastructure. He talks about empowering workers um, in order to deal with the fact that wages have been stagnant, as well as proper industrial strategy. This has to be the new common sense, and I hope it will become the new common sense. And uh, speaking of... Um changes. Uh, is it time to get rid of Dominic Cummings, do you think, as Kevin Maguire says? Well, probably. And the reason is, you know, as the best advisors are in the background making things happen. Um, and when you start becoming the story, I think that's a problem. But more importantly, he is a fantastic campaigner, without a doubt. All the campaigns he's been on, he's pretty much won. But can he govern? Can he help the Prime Minister govern? And actually, all the indications suggest that he can't because he is naturally disruptive. Um, he's the sort of guy that wants to tear things down rather than build things up, and he can't build coalitions and alliances. And the Prime Minister has an incredibly tough agenda because it's not just about the post-Brexit landscape, it's not just about agreeing the free trade agreement, but he's got to grip some of these big reform problems from housing through to regional inequality. And you've got to be able to get the civil service to work and just tearing things apart and tearing things down is not the way through that. What do you make of Claire Foge's argument? I mean, she's basically saying we are getting an enormous number of people now risking their lives trying to cross the channel and the way to stop it is for people to know they're not going to get anywhere when they get in, which means more enforcement, more boats and doing things like they're planning to do tomorrow with these uh, uh, Jamaican citizens. Well, so clearly there is uh, a large number of people uh, that are coming here through kind of illegal means, and we do need to find a way of getting to grips with it. I don't think that the response of essentially no tolerance and trying to send a clear message that, you know, migrants can't come here is going to cut it, quite frankly. You have to think about the desperation that means that people are willing to often take their families under such, such hazardous conditions in order to come here. And, you know, in truth, when you think about both um, globally and and uh, economic reasons, but also climate change. The number of illegal migrants that will come from that are going to increase. So we do need a response. And my view is that, in part, that has to be international. I think we need to... so that there is a clear process for genuine refugees and asylum seekers to enter countries. There should be zero tolerance for smugglers, because actually what they're doing is absolutely criminal, and you need a concerted effort to ensure that people aren't exploiting desperate people um, and putting them in difficult situations. Um, but, you know, I do think that asylum has always played a part in this country's uh, view about migration and our uh, settlement, and I don't think that should change, because... There are desperate conditions that mean that people will have to seek asylum and we need to be able to accommodate that. It just strikes me that this Labour leadership contest is, is not really grabbing the public's attention. Well, no, in so far as... I mean, it is a long, long contest, um, so it's quite hard to hold uh, the public's attention for that period of time. If you think back to the general election, I think most people didn't really engage with the fact that the general election was happening until about a couple of weeks beforehand. But what I do think is quite interesting about uh, the Labour leadership contest is, you know, we've now got a field of candidates, um, but there is consensus about the economic direction um, of the Labour Party. And if you look at kind of Keir Starmer, you look at Lisa Nandy, you look at Rebecca Long, Bailey, there are differences in swathe and hue, but broadly, the sort of ideas, you know, a lot that, you know, my organisation have quite a lot of sympathy for them, um, and actually that mirrors some of the things that were being said by Nick Timothy, um, suggest there is a consensus that's emerging that says, fundamentally, when we're trying to deal with climate change, we're trying to deal with inequality, we need a different set of interventions in order uh, to shift the dial. Do you think um, Keir Starmer's going to win? 
I think, I mean, if you base it on the number of nominations coming out of the CLP, he looks like he's in a really strong position. So I think it's his to lose now. Um, and to be fair to him, I think the thing he's played very, very well is, you know, the Labour Party isn't particularly ideological. Um, it's a set of people that are kind of driven. Well, you know, so people often think Labour Party is quite ideological, but most of the members are driven by values, are driven by a kind of desire to see social justice and things improve in the country. But they are values driven first and foremost. And I think he's been very effective in saying, actually, if you think about my motivation, if you think about my values, the things that drive me as a politician, they're fundamentally rooted in the things that's always been in Labour tradition. And I think because of that, he's appealing to quite a broad spectrum of the Labour Party. And if the Labour Party does nothing else after this, it's got to unite. People don't like factional divided parties. The public don't trust them to do anything and certainly don't trust them to govern the country. So whoever wins must be someone that can unite the Labour Party. But you don't hear Labour, any of the Labour candidates, saying, yes, we're going to uh, take money from Westminster and give more to local councils, do you? Uh, well, so, actually, there have been a couple of interventions. So Lisa Nandy's been really strong on this, and, actually, Keir Starmer came out a couple of weeks ago saying a huge devolution revolution as part of a new constitutional settlement. So, actually, the Labour Party, which, you know, one of, for me, the big disappointments in the manifesto is that they barely said anything um, in the last election about devolution, and it feels like they're trying to grip that, because I think you are right. Part of the answer to this is about pushing power and resources out. I mean, I'm a bit less pessimistic, I think, than John, because I think, actually, you can rebuild the social infrastructure um, in some of these communities. The key is giving the communities the power in order to do that. But I do think there is a kind of contradiction in the government's policy here, because on the one hand, they're talking about 80 billion of capital investment. But on the other hand, they're talking about cutting revenue, cutting day-to-day -day spend. And in truth, you know, economically it makes no sense because you cannot, you cannot level up, you cannot fundamentally gear up these economies unless you're willing to invest in social infrastructure as well as the hard kit. But also politically it makes no sense. You know, infrastructure investment is going to take 10 years to materialise. In five years' time, they need to show those electorates that they've done something, which means you've got to think about day-to-day -day spend, you've got to think about spending on social infrastructure as well.